and economist Rosamund Irwin and Conservative commentator and author Joanne uh, Nadler. Now just talk me through, it's been a horrendous uh, campaign and results for Theresa May. Can she stay and for how long? Um, I think she's looking like an Alec, uh, Sir Alec Douglas home now. Um, in terms of the length, uh, she'll, she'll manage a little bit longer because even if we have a leadership campaign, that will stretch it beyond his days. But she's got a lot of the same failings, and there's a reason people are drawing comparisons. Um, she's come across as stiff. She doesn't understand enough about economics and business. And on, on top of that, she hasn't really put across something to the electorate that they relate to. Um, so I think we're looking at a very truncated prime ministerial term. The question, of course, um, that John um, went through there is who are the candidates? Amber Rubb. Rudd actually struggled even to win her seat. It did look at one point in the night that she might lose it. She has a tiny majority uh, there, so that's a, a problem for her. She's also obviously quite new to politics. So, um, so she's got the problem. Boris is not very popular anymore. He's lost what he had as, as London Mayor of being a bit of a maverick. He hasn't made great choices, I would say, at the Foreign Office. And David Davis, well, he feels like, you know, he's tried before. He lost, obviously, to David Cameron. Um, and he lost having been the firm favourite at the start of that campaign, of course. So the options aren't that great. Uh, Philip Hammond, say pair of hands, an attractive option perhaps to many. And we know later on today it's likely she's going to announce this reshuffle in her cabinet. The top five posts staying the same. But even there, there are tensions, aren't there? You've got Boris Johnson, who's vying, we understand, to become the leader, a leadership bid at least. And then Philip Hammond, we know there's been a bit of a dispute between them anyhow. Well, one has the impression that what the Conservative Party do, is doing at the moment is taking a, a sort of a huge uh, intake of breath and, and hanging on. Um, she's being kept in place by centrifugal forces, if I can put it that way, that you don't want to pull out one piece of the puzzle because the whole thing could collapse. But it's extremely hard to see, I think, how she can go into the party conference period as leader. I don't know what speech she makes to the, to the party faithful. There's been a poll today on the very influential Conservative Home website indicating I think that two out of three party members uh, would like to see her resign. The question is how how is this process now enacted? One thing is for certain, I don't think anybody uh, in the Conservative family, if I can put it that way, wants to face another general election. But the other thing is, I think very few people will want her to be leader at the next general election. So there are these kind of fixed points, if you like, and it's a question of how uh, the party now navigates through that in view of the fact that there's this huge piece of uh, public policy in terms of Brexit that, that has to be handled and is, of course, the most important thing, along with the other big um, problems facing the country. But do you think there will be an early election? Well, of course, if we have another leadership, a, a Conservative leadership leader, uh, leadership um, election, then we'll have the, prob the same problem she had of somebody who is in theory, an unelected Prime Minister. Of course, we don't elect our Prime Minister. That was a sort of slightly unfair criticism all along. But she knew that this was niggling away and that she had to be te tested with a general election. And that's going to be somebody, in theory, obviously, if, we've got, if we do go back to the fixed-term parliaments, that's five years of somebody, nearly, of somebody being chipped away at. And now this partnership that she's going to make with the DUP, is this going to be problematic for her? Because we know that they've got a, a number of controversial views, almost biblical in some respects. Well, and they certainly don't like Catholics. And as a Catholic, <laughs> I find that, I mean, that is a very unpleasant bit. Gay marriage, she's got a lot of pro uh, problems. And obviously Ruth Davidson has been very yes. uh, strong and saying... Absolutely, absolutely. None as, of this I, acceptable. I, I, as she's had to be. But um, let's look at it in terms of, as I say, the big... Uh, policy issue facing her in, in the immediate term, which is Brexit. And uh, it seems that they can lend her their support on, on that. And of course, they don't want an Irish border. They don't want a, a border with yeah. the Republic of Ireland, which is actually probably helpful. So in exactly. that respect, do you think exactly. we will see a softer Brexit, perhaps staying within the single market? Is that a possibility? Now, I think that, that that's inevitable. I think all things are now sort of on the table as far as the Brexit negotiation is concerned. I think a lot of the problem that she had during, during the election campaign was the sort of rhetoric she was using about Brexit, not necessarily because it was hard or soft, whatever that means, but simply because it was indecipherable to most people. I mean, what actually was her policy on Brexit? Even for people that were in favour of Brexit, there was no real explanation of, what, of how she was going to uh, create the um, necessary economic climate for Britain to flourish outside Brexit. So uh, a, a very many questions kind of raised and completely unanswered, 
where you fight an election campaign where you're just relying on slogans that are, are frankly totally facile. Mm. Well, yeah, she said strong and stable. We're anything but now. So well, we're, 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 and we're, the coalition here, oh, which has been delivered, you know. So what does that mean for these Brexit negotiations? Is she going to get us a deal? Well, I, the, the, the sort of thing that I always thought was an untruth was all along she said, well, I'm, I want to have this strong majority so I can go to Europe. Europe doesn't care how many, you know, in the EU. They didn't think, oh, she's only got a majority of eight. That was a problem. Now she's severely weakened. It wouldn't really have helped if she'd gone there with a majority of eight or whatever. Um, that said, now she is weakened. You know, she's put it to the electorate. The electorate did not like her version of Brexit that quite rightly, was, as you said, was not properly outlined or explained. Um, but it had all these worrying things of, oh, we might just crash out. So people sort of, even people who supported leave for them, alarm mm. bells were going, yeah, I think. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, and I think what Jeremy Corbyn benefited from, which is sort of odd because obviously he was never somebody who really liked the EU, but he did vote, he did benefit from the fact that lots of people thought actually backing him was a protest against that hard Brexit. And we saw her yesterday when she came out at number 10, she made her speech, but she didn't really acknowledge. Terrible speech. I mean, what uh, would you be advising her to do uh, now? I mean, I, I was somewhat flabbergasted by that speech because my feeling was in the immediate aftermath of the result, I thought, okay, well, she's bound to come out now and um, a very hard balancing act, I, I, I grant you, um, in having to acknowledge um, that effectively the gamble hadn't paid off, um, that she had made a mistake, but nonetheless um, she wants to serve the country, she will you know, listen to what, she's, uh, what, what, what this roar from the country seems to be. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's ironic in many ways because some of the things that she had begun to uh, talk about in her own opening speech at number 10 when she was first elected last year well, you know, were really interesting and, and she looked like she had got her finger on the pulse of, uh, of essentially what had happened with a lot of voters north of, the, uh, you know, north of London, outside London in terms of Brexit and, and she was beginning to outline some interesting social reform um, and, and yet we haven't really heard anything more, very much more about that and I would have wanted her to, you know, to, to explain with some passion what her vision was. I wanted that during the election campaign and I wanted a bit more of that yesterday and I think that the tone of the, of the address yesterday was, was, was totally miscalculated. Hence needing a second speech. And of course her advisers now under pressure um, for her to you know, take action against them but thank you very much for joining us. You are watching